All right, now you can take a seat. Sorry, it's, we're Catholic. It happens, right? The up, down, up, down, down. Um, right on. We've been praying for tonight. We're so excited for tonight. And, you know, like, I, I don't know about you guys, but this time of year, it's so easy for it to get busy. Raise your hand if you feel like this is sort of a teetering week for you, like, and it's starting to get busy. Okay, every year, Advent, this is kind of a defining week, right? Where, like, we can either, like, lean more into the peace of Advent and Christmas and, and Jesus, right, and the reason for the season, or we can, like, quickly get bulldozed by the noise and the materialism and the shopping and the, like, everything that, right, our, our world wants to make Christmas. And so, like, right now, we, we're kind of at a decision point, right? Like, we're, we're at a moment here. And I, I don't know about you guys, when I start to get really busy, I start to think of these, like, times where I wish I could just escape to. These memories I had where it was calm, where it was peaceful, where there was beauty and this goodness. And just a real quick story before we, we start with worship here. Um, one of the most amazing, serene, peaceful beauty-filled moments of my life was when I uh, went to visit a, a friend of mine who was a missionary in Nicaragua. And basically, there's like, we're near a volcano, we're, it's basically a crater filled with water, this beautiful lake up in the mountains. And we go kayaking just as the sun is starting to set, and we go out into the lake on this kayak. And I remember it's just so clearly Right, as the sun starts to get lower, the sky just like explodes with this beautiful like golden pink, right? You know what I mean? And we're out there, and as we make our way towards the middle of the lake, the wind just stops and it just becomes like glass. And there's this beautiful calm. And to our surprise, on the other side of these mountains, as we're, we're going this way, the, the, the mountains over there, the sun's behind us, this storm <laughs> starts to approach over the mountains. Right? And so there's rain over there. And this sun, as it's setting, just like, boom, hits that water. And it's just like beautiful rainbow. Gets cast over this like clear water. And I could you not, straight all the way across and then full circle reflection underneath. And I remember I was on this kayak and me and my friend just were breathless. I'm pretty sure like, I like tried to stand up. I fell in the water. Like, it, we were just like, what are we looking at? Like, our, our, we couldn't comprehend. There's just this beauty. I remember in that stillness, and all you could hear was like the little ripples up against the wave just uh, of the, the kayak just lapping. You know what I mean? Can you hear it? I'm reminded of a great calm that we read about in Scripture where you guys know the story, right? Like Jesus and his disciples are out on a boat, and they're out on the water, and then a huge storm comes. And you guys know the story, right? They start losing their minds. The disciples think, like, this is the end. The storm is really bad. And they run to Jesus. And what's Jesus doing? He's asleep. He's asleep in the boat. And they're like, Jesus, wake up. We're going to die. And Jesus, he gets up and he says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And he goes out of the, you know, his little wherever he was sleeping. And he goes and he speaks to the storm. And the storm obeys. And it just falls silent. It's calm, the water, the waves just all calm down. And it says in scripture that there was a great calm. A great calm. My prayer for us this evening is that we would run to the Lord and say, Lord, like, uh, we're busy. <laughs> we're stressed out. Things are crazy. Things are not well. Have you seen what's going on in my family? Lord, help us. We're perishing. And that the Lord would come in our midst and just say, Calm, and there would be a great calm when we find that peace. Can we do that? I, I don't know about you guys, but I want that right now, okay, in this week. Like, let's be open to that. Uh, amen. So right off the bat, we're going to turn to the Lord. We're going to worship. I'm confident that God can be very good. So let's just stand again, and let's worship Jesus together um, in, the, in a song of praise. We are who he says we are. Amen? Amen. 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 Come, Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God, we, we adore you, we love you, and we praise you. We ask that you um, come into our busy lives, our minds and our hearts, Lord, that you would calm the storms. Give us this great calm, this great peace, this trust in you. Our hearts are open, our ears are open, Lord, to what you have in store for us tonight. Amen.
Lord Jesus, we ask that you move in power tonight and speak the truth about who we are to our hearts, that we would come alive in you more tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. You guys can take a seat. All right. So tonight... Um, you know, it's our Advent mission, and normally we'll have a visiting priest or a speaker come and, and speak to us, right? And, and the idea is that some, from far off, somebody would come and just cast fire on our parish. And tonight's a little different, right? Like, I, I, we're just St. Francis here. Like, it's us. Like, I work here. Like, like there's, there's no guests. Like, it's just, it's just us. Amen? Yeah. And, and I'm kind of excited about that because I, I really do think it's not like... Like the speaker and then us, it's just us. And together, we can turn to God as a parish and just say, come Lord Jesus, amen? Like if, like to, if tonight, just we together as St. Francis as a parish just turn our eyes to heaven and said like, God, like we're here. Like, like make us new, bring renewal to our parish. Like make us holy, like Jesus, come. Raise your hand if you're for that tonight. Like, if you're just ready and with me to say, Lord, like, okay, like, but we're ready and we're here. St. Francis, like, is yours. Um, and so tonight, you know, as a parish and, and as a staff, we've been praying about some tangible habits that we want. Like, if every, we're just imagining, we're dreaming big. If every parishioner, if every person here at St. Francis did these three things, it would be a game changer for our parish. And tonight I want to focus on the first one, and it's, it's this. Prayer. Prayer, right? Like, prayer. It's simple. It sounds so simple. But, like, if each one of us every day... We're spending some quality time with God. I'm convinced that our parish would, would just totally change. Amen? Amen? Amen. So prayer. I think there's some confusion about prayer, to be honest, because it can sound like one more thing that I have to do or it's something that I do. But if you take anything away from this mission tonight, I want it to be this, okay? It's that prayer is not about us doing more. It's about us doing less so that God can do more in us. Amen? I'm going to say that again. Prayer is not about us doing more. Prayer is about us doing less so that God can do more in our lives. Prayer is about receiving and resting and relaxing into God's goodness and love for us. When's the last time you thought about prayer like that? Prayer is about resting, receiving, and relaxing into God's goodness and love for us. Is it easy? Maybe for some, for me, prayer oftentimes is a battle. It's a struggle, right? It takes a certain effort. But once we wade through that, that painful silence sometimes of this waiting of our anxiety, and we push through it, we find there a God who loves us and wants to share his life with us. Amen? Amen. As I was praying and preparing for this mission, this story from Exodus came to mind. And many of us know the story, right, of, of God and, and Moses. And there's this really intense scene that I want to unpack for us right off the bat tonight. And it's of, okay, God has just brought his people out of slavery in Egypt into the wilderness. Moses is being spoken to by God, and they out in the wilderness finally come to this place called Mount Sinai, right? And we know that God descends upon this mountain and gives God's people, through Moses, the Ten Commandments. But right before that happens, there's this really intense scene, and I want to unpack it for us. This is what happens. Ah, it's so, it, gosh, it gives me goosebumps to even think about. So imagine, you're out in the wilderness, you just escaped slavery, um, and Moses is told by God that in three days, God himself is going to descend upon the mountaintop. God, God is going to descend upon, upon the mountaintop. And it's in fire, in a thick cloud, and lightning, and thunder, and, and God's going to be there. And he says to Moses, you need to get the people ready and gather them around the base of this mountain. Okay, can you picture the scene? And he says, don't let them touch the mountain. I'm so holy and like I'm going to be up there. But if anybody crosses the barrier and comes and actually even touches the mountain, they will die. Pretty intense, right? Like, like nothing should touch this mountain. But you, Moses, are invited up the mountain. 
And I imagine Moses going to the people and saying, guys, listen, we're going to gather around the mountain in three days. God's going to come. It's going to be pretty intense. Don't even touch the mountain. Like, don't even go, like, get, get, get to where I say you can go, but do not pass this barrier, okay? And he's looking at everybody. He's like, okay, okay. And everybody's like, okay, all right. And so imagine, like, they're gathered around this mountain. And I am, gosh, like, I'm thinking to myself, if I was in the crowd, and I know God's going to be up there, and if anybody touches this mountain, they're going to die. And then Moses gets out of his tent or wherever and crosses that barrier, and then he starts going up the mountain, and there's fire and thick cloud and lightning, and God's up there. I'm going to be like, Moses, don't do it. You're crazy. What are you thinking? Like, it's not too late. Turn back now. Come on, be with us. But then maybe after he like lives, he's halfway up, and I see him getting smaller and going up, and like I hear the thunder and the lightning. I'm like, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. Like, go, go, Moses, go. And like, he's going up there, and imagine him being enveloped in this cloud. And I just want to read to you what's happening here. Okay, all right? Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain, and Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke of it descended upon it in fire. And the smoke of it went up like smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke. And God answered him in thunder. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. And Moses went up. I imagine him just being up there and hearing the thunder, this sort of like call and response perhaps between Moses and God. And they're they're, they're speaking. And then he comes down. And I would just be like, he's alive. He's coming back. And as he's getting closer, I, the question in my mind, and maybe for you, it would be like, what did he say? What did God say? Like, tell, I'd be like, tell me, please, Moses. Like, what did he say? What is he like? You know what I mean? Like, tell us, Moses, tell us what happened up there. What is he like? And now here's the thing. A lot of us, myself included, will we'll go hear a talk by Father Mike Schmitz. Or like, we'll go hear some awesome, like, homily from Father Sojin. Or like, we'll we'll hear these messages and we'll we'll lean on our pastors. And a lot of us come with this anticipation of like, what is he like? Tell us, what did he say? Feed us. Like, you've been with God, now you tell us. You tell me. That's a lot of pressure, right, Father Sojin? (laughs) A lot of of pressure on our pastors and priests and guest speakers. Be like, what? You tell us. Going to be with God, that, that's for you, but not us. Like, we can't go up the mountain. Guys, I, I don't know if you know this, but like, that was the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament now, amen? Like, that was the Old Covenant. We're in the New and Everlasting Covenant now, amen? You see, something happened at the crucifixion that through Jesus and his death and resurrection, he won for us access through him to the Father, to God, Amen? It, the hair on the back of our neck should stand up. We should freak us out. Give us goosebumps. and be like, we get to go up the mountain? We get to cross the barrier? Like, you get to. Amen? Guys, I'm so excited. Like, and, and this is what it looks like often for me going up the mountain. You know what it looks like? I go into my room. I shut the door. I sit on my bed. <laughs> and I, I go up the mountain. And I'm like, God? God? I get to, I, I get to speak to God. You get to speak to God in the silence, in the stillness, in the simplicity because of what Jesus did on the cross. See, guys, like, isn't this just the crazy, beautiful good news? See, it gets better. This is actually what makes it good news. Back then, it was one person, a human, Moses, who went up the mountain as a mediator to go and receive from God and then to bring that word back to the people. But God became man. There's one not-so-subtle difference, right, between Moses and Jesus, and it's that Jesus is God. Right? He's fully man, but also fully God. 
And the good news of our gospel is that we don't have now the image of one man going up a mountain to find God. We have the image of a God who became man coming to seek us. Can we round up? Like, that's what makes this good news. Like, it's not about our effort and us just being like, all right, I need to go up there. I need to work hard. Like, maybe God will accept me. It's not about that anymore. Like, Jesus came down. And isn't that the good news of Christmas? That we have a God who said, for you, I'm coming for you. I'm coming down the mountain. Amen? And the door to heaven isn't at the top of some lofty mountain. It's right here in our hearts where the Lord seeks and says the scripture that the Lord himself is knocking that fiery, big, omnipotent, like, glorious God came down the mountain and is now, like, in our face every day, like, I want to be in a relationship with you. I want you to know me. I want you to see the way that I see you. I think the manger, Jesus' quiet life growing up, Nazareth, his work as a humble carpenter and builder, and when he began his public ministry and the way that he lived with people, broke bread with them, ate with them, healed them. I think of all the stories, everything from Jesus turning water into wine to raising his friend Lazarus from the dead to calming the sea to walking on water. I think of all these stories and, and I hear his parables and his messages and the more, guys, I, I turn to this book and the more every day I, I just try to learn from Jesus, the more I realize that when he looks out at us, he doesn't see a crowd. When he looks out at us, we're not anonymous. He sees his son. He sees his daughter. You, he knows your name. Amen. Gosh, the Christmas story, what makes it such good news is that we have a God who is revealed to us as personal and love itself. Amen? Amen. In the catechism, it gives reasons for the incarnation, and one of them is, it just blows my mind, it's that we would become partakers in the divine nature. You know what that means? That we would become partakers in the divine nature. Jesus came, Christmas happened, the cross happened so that I would become a partaker in the divine nature. I'm not just flesh and blood up here, amen? Like, I, 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 I'm a partaker in the divine nature. Like, that's, that's awesome. Like, that's good news. And so are you. Like, through our baptism, like, through frequent participation in the sacraments, through confession, through the Eucharist, God himself, God, is sharing his inner life with us. We get to go up the mountain, and all we have to do to go up there is say, come Lord Jesus, amen? Say, come Lord, yes, in the Eucharist, yes, in confession, yes, through my baptism every day, and yes, through daily quiet time with God. There's an image I want to share with you. Can I do that real quick? Okay, here we go. So, this candle right here represents Jesus, okay, in his life, and he wants to make us partakers in the divine nature, Amen? And that's good news. And as Catholics, we toss around a term called grace a lot. Okay, we say grace a lot. And, and what, but what does that really mean? Grace is God's inner life. Okay? And it's freely given to us. We don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. There's nothing we can do to get more of it. But God, out of his sheer goodness, wants to give us his inner life. Amen? And that's good news. That's good news. This candle right here represents us. Okay? And now, whether we believe in God or not, whether we've seen God move in our lives or not, like, we were made to be partakers in the divine nature. Does that blow your mind? We were made for it. So get this. When we, through baptism and the sacraments and a life of prayer, come and, whoa, whoa, yes, come and spend time with Jesus, um, we become partakers in God's own life. Okay? This, this is a very similar image to what happens at baptism, right? Okay, from the Easter candle over there is lit a candle that's given to the godparent when someone's baptized normally. And here you go. Like, we're now partaking of the divine nature. Woo! Like, we sing. Hallelujah. Like, amen. Okay, so sin, right, it puts this light out, and then we go to confession, and we come back, and boom, like, we're back. But every day, in this simple stillness and silence and quiet, we have an opportunity to just make our heart a wick. <laughs> Sounds kind of funny, right? Like we're a wick. 
And we just come before the Lord and say, God, like, I long for joy. I long for happiness. I want peace. I want fulfillment. And I have sensed in the world that nothing, no matter how hard I try, will truly satisfy. So today, I'm going to turn to you. I'm going to spend 30 minutes with you. I'm just going to close the door. I'm going to come and I'm going to be with you. And my heart's a whip, Lord, and your love is the flame. Amen? And we just spend time with Jesus. And we receive. And we rest. Um, you know, in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, when you come to pray, don't pray like... The, the hypocrites or the Pharisees, right, who like to pray on the street corners and speak lots of words hoping that they will receive praise, right, from, from men. Or, um, and he says, instead, what I want you to do, guys, is go into your room and close the door, and then your heavenly Father who sees in secret will reward you. Amen? Like Jesus is, is teaching us, like, go to silence and solitude. And that's uncomfortable. Raise your hand if, like, you spend five minutes in silence and all that comes to mind is your problems. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes, that's me. And I'm tempted. And, and this is what we do so, so often. We, sorry. Ah, okay. So, we go to silence and we're like, okay, Jesus, we shut the door. We turn our phone to silence and we just turn it off. We're trying to eliminate distractions. I'm trying to pray. And so, we go to our room and then we spend five minutes and we're like, I, I, that was not a good experience. And we, maybe we get distracted and we stop. And we give it up all together. And this is what I like to call just like a drive-by prayer. Like we tried. It was a really good effort. But we're just like, shoo, right off the top. We're just like, shoo. all right, high bye Jesus. A little kiss on the cheek, you know? All right. In order to receive, it's uncomfortable. This is where prayer becomes a battle, I believe. It takes a certain effort to say, Lord, I'm going to just wait it out. Because God does reward us in secret, amen? And if we push through that uncomfortable pause and we say, Lord, I have a lot of problems. This is uncomfortable. I'm really busy. I don't have time for you today, but I trust you anyway. So I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to wait. And when we give God the time, our hearts do catch fire, amen? Like peace does come. But it, it's not immediate. I think of great saints like Mother Teresa, who it says, despite her great holiness, right? Many of us have heard stories about Mother Teresa. She didn't feel close to God, but she persevered. Because she knew that prayer was not about a feeling. Prayer is about a person. Amen? Let's say that again. Prayer is not about a feeling. Prayer is about a person. If we don't feel anything when we go to God, does it mean that God's not there? No, I would argue that he's inviting us to push through that calm. And what we're going to do tonight is open our hearts to the Lord in prayer. And maybe our anxieties came up, come up. Maybe the busyness, the things that we have to do. Maybe we have a sense of, I should be in bed right now. I have a long day tomorrow. Like, I'm really busy. And the Lord is inviting us to just spend some quality time with him tonight. Amen? Mother Teresa, she has this, this beautiful quote I want to end with before we, we spend even more time with God. She's speaking to her sisters, right? She founded the Missionaries of Charity. She's speaking to the sisters in her community. Consecrated sisters, like these are people you think that definitely know Jesus, right? And, and this is what she says to her, to her sisters. She says, I worry that some of you still have not really met Jesus. One to one. You and him alone. Jesus wants me to tell you again how much is the love he has for each one of you. Beyond all that you can imagine, we may spend time in chapel, but have you seen with the eyes of your soul how he looks at you with love? Do you really know the living Jesus, not from books, but from being with him in your heart? Have you heard the loving words he speaks to you? Never give up on this daily, intimate contact with Jesus as a real living person, not just an idea. How can we last even one day living our life without hearing Jesus say, I love you? <laughs> Impossible. Our soul needs that as much as the body needs to breathe the air. If not, prayer is dead. Meditation, only thinking. Jesus wants you each to hear him speaking in the silence of your heart. Not only he loves you even more, he longs for you. He misses you when you don't come close. He thirsts for you. He loves you always, even when you don't feel worthy. Even if you are not accepted by others, even by yourself sometimes. 
He is the one who always accepts you. Why does Jesus say, I thirst? What does it mean? Something so hard to explain in words. If you remember anything from Mother's letter, remember this. I thirst is something much deeper than just Jesus saying, I love you. Until you know deep inside that Jesus thirsts for you, you can't begin to know who he wants to be for you or who he wants you to be. He knows your weakness. He wants only your love, wants only the chance to love you. He wants only the chance to love you. And, and every day, this is the last, the last thing here, like I, I've been praying and a word that keeps coming to mind is maybe this response we're tempted to have towards this invitation, which is, I don't have time. I don't have time. That's a luxury. Quiet time. I have two little kids. I have a two-year-old and a two-month-old. Quiet times, you know, it can feel like a luxury. But Jesus didn't come to Bethlehem. He didn't come and die on the cross so that I could just say, that's for some. That's a luxury. That's not for me. Every time we walked into the church, I heard a great saint who said that he's been waiting for us for 2,000 years for the chance to love you. Tonight, guys, I just ask that you give God a chance to love you, amen? To just rest, to just be, to receive the true light of the world that illuminates the darkness in our lives. Can we do that? In just a, a few moments, the God of the universe is coming down the mountain to be with us uh, in something called Eucharistic adoration. And Jesus is gonna be face to face with us, right? As Catholics, we believe that Jesus is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in what appears to be bread, but is actually his true presence. Amen? Like, it's Jesus in his personality and his goodness and his life and his love and the fullness of who he is and all his glory. He's going to be just feet away from us. And all we have to do is say, come, Lord Jesus, and open our hearts to him. Take note of the words that come to mind tonight. Take note of what Jesus does in your heart. And if at the end of prayer you feel like you want to talk to someone or pray with someone, we're going to have an opportunity for you to do that in something called prayer teams. No pressure. Tonight's about you and Jesus. Amen? Amen. Guys, let's, let's worship the Lord. When Jesus comes out, it's customary to kneel at first. But if you want to sit during adoration, stand and praise him, feel free during the time of adoration. Cool? Come, Lord Jesus, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, you are welcome here. Come, Lord Jesus.
please, Neil? Salutari sostia que celebrati sostio per la pregunta ostilia